All right, well, thank you very much for the time for giving up your Friday morning. I understand it's the last day of term for you there in Madrid. It's also the last day of term here for us in New South Wales. Um, so as you can see, the link at the top will allow you to ask questions as we go through and we'll, we can do some Q&A at the end also. Uh, my name's Brendan. Um, if I don't know what Dave's told you. My name's Brendan. I'm a primary trained teacher. Um, I was teaching year one and two up until a couple of weeks ago when I joined ClickView. Uh, they kindly offered me a, a job doing something a little bit different, uh, something a little bit exciting, and I thought, why not uh, go on a new adventure? So I'd encourage you to take as many notes as you want to throughout this, um, but I will be making the slide deck and also the recording of this presentation uh, available uh, to Dave afterwards. I can email him the links uh, where he can access both of those. So don't worry about uh, missing a key piece of information because you will have access to it uh, later on as well. So as we go through this, I want you to keep this question in the back of your mind. This is the key driving question behind flipped learning because we don't have enough time in the classroom to get through everything that we need to get through as far as the curriculum goes but also everything that we would like to get through as far as the well-being and the pastoral care side of things goes. There's just not enough time. So I want you to consider this question as we go through. Now, uh, there is a massive online presence of flipped learning. Um, I don't know how many people on your site are online as far as having a, a social media presence, Twitter, Facebook, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, if you are interested and you want to find out more about uh, flipped learning in general, uh, there's some links there. The top website, that's my professional website. There's a page there that's called Starting with Flipped Learning, and there is a huge range of resources there that are freely available for anyone to access. There's a link to some educators and their channels on YouTube, and you can actually see what current teachers are doing as far as what their flipped videos look like in a range of subjects, in a range of um, age groups. And there's also a link to my li uh, list of teachers who are flipping on Twitter. Um, I think there's about 105 teachers that I've got on there at the moment, spread all across the globe, a um, range of different subjects, a range of different um, age levels as well. If you are a Twitter person, um, my handle is at C21 underscore teaching. I would definitely recommend uh, following John Bergman. He's widely recognized as the godfather of flipped learning. He's certainly the chief evangelist, um, and he really pushes flipped learning globally. If you want to pursue flipped learning more, you can actually do a certification in flipped learning, um, flglobal.org. There's a page called training there with links to the training course. It was, uh, it's about eight hours uh, total. And it was for me, I don't know what the conversion rate, but for me, it was, a, I think from memory, 120 Australian. I don't know what that converts to in uh, Spanish currency though, I'm afraid. Moving on. Looking at the research, I often get asked by people who are new to flipped learning, what about the research? What research is there that actually backs this up? Five years ago, I would have had to say not much. But as you can see from this graph, there's been a significant increase in the range of research that's been conducted in flipped learning uh, and different iterations of that. Um, a lot of that now has to do with not does it work, but how can we make it better? How can we make it stronger so that it has a bigger impact on our students' learning? There's a huge range of articles and books available on Google Scholar. Um, since 2016 pu publications, we're looking around about 13,000. And across that huge range, there's... Sorry? Am I coming through okay on your end? All good? Yeah, we're okay. We just lost you a little bit. No worries. Uh, so I'll just backtrack a second there. I don't know what you missed out on. Um, basically, Google Scholar, there's a massive range of research. There are some general themes that are coming out uh, from all of the research in flipped learning. You know, students who are in these classrooms where things are being flipped are seeing improved test scores. They're seeing improved self-efficacy in the subject area. But more importantly, perhaps, they're also seeing an improved ability to transfer the skills and the knowledge across domains, which I think cross-curricular application is kind of the goldmine uh, for teaching. There are some general benefits for the teacher. The student-teacher ratio is diminished. In my classroom last year, I was using flip videos for a number of subjects. Uh, for mathematics, for example, I, would have, I had three groups 
uh, in my class, which meant that each group would be watching a video that I had uh, created or curated from YouTube or somewhere else, which meant that there was myself physically, but there was also three other versions of me in the classroom. So there was effectively four teachers in that classroom, which meant that I could work with a group of students at the front who needed additional support or extension or whatever, whatever the case might be. But the other students who were watching the video, they were getting one-to-one -one explicit instruction from myself. So I'm still teaching them, and if anything, the relationship's improved. You also see that you get more time because you're dealing with the two bottom levels of Bloom's taxonomy prior to coming into class. That frees more time up to do, well, whatever it is that you want to do. If you're a science teacher, it might be experiments. If you're a PE teacher, it might be more fundamental movement skills or sports or activities. It depends on your context and what you're teaching. But the general sort of benefit that we're seeing is that you can go deeper, you can go broader, and you can do more hands-on activities. Uh, this particular piece of research was published in January this year, so it's actually really current. It was a meta-analysis of 15 studies looking at flipped learning that took place specifically in K-12 situations, kindergarten to year 12. And there's a couple of general findings that they came up with. First of all, they acknowledged that flipped learning is not going to fix everything that's wrong with education. I don't think there is such a silver bullet. But they found that it promotes active learning from students and that it doesn't have a negative impact, which is obviously rather important, but that conversely it actually seems that students perform significantly better than students who are in traditional classrooms with rows or groups of tables and chairs and the teacher at the front. Now, in terms of the traditional classroom, I'm sure we've all seen this photo or t styles, you know, different variations on this photo. The industrial age is what we have to thank for this. It was the first time that we had a need for mass education and we had to find a way to make it work. The careers at that point in time were driven around bells and whistles, which meant that we took that model and we applied it to school. And so school was driven around bells and whistles, recess, lunch breaks, and for secondary, you know, different periods through the day. And we haven't really moved on from that, which means that we're now at the point where we have people like Sir Kurt Robinson um, delivering messages like this. Uh, we have a system of education that is modelled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organised on factory lines, so ringing bells, separate facilities, uh, specialised into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. I personally disagree with a lot of what Sir Ken says in that particular video, but you can't really argue with that. Uh, I don't know how things operate there in Spain, but here in New South Wales, in Australia, schools operate. There's a bell at 8.55 for the start of the day. There's a bell at the start of recess and so on throughout the day. Everything runs around the bells of school because that was the model of industry that we were used to, which meant that just got applied to school. So what, what, what happens next? And again, I want you to consider what is the most valuable use of your face-to-face -face time with students. What would you rather be doing than dealing with the bottom two levels of Bloom's taxonomy? I'm not trying to diminish those. They are incredibly important. They're the foundational structures for going deeper and further. But if you could take care of that before students come to class, what would you rather do? I want you to take you know, about a minute and jot something down, one or two things that you would rather be doing with your students than working through the bottom two levels of Bloom's taxonomy on whatever your subject area might be. If you happen to be connected, feel free to jump to this website down the bottom here. It'll take you to a Padlet, uh, which will allow you to send your thoughts through, and we can have a look at those up on the screen. Well, I'll give you about a minute just to jot a few things down. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
All right, we sound like we're getting close to being fairly done on that end. It sounds like there's some interesting chat going on as well. So with this particular question in mind, let's have a look at what's actually going on and why we're doing this. Now, I'd like you to think about your own education. And I'll give you an example from mine. Year 10 mathematics, it was term one and we were doing quadratic equations. Teacher explained it in class. I was like, yep, I, I, I get this. Teacher gave us some questions to solve in class. Yep, I can do this. Teacher assigned chapter two questions, one to 30, do the odd numbered questions for homework. I had three other classes that day, got home, sat down, opened my book. I have no idea how to solve this. I'd forgotten what I needed to know to solve that particular, those particular questions. I hadn't actually understood it properly, which meant that I was faced with the more difficult questions now, trying to apply the knowledge, but I had less help. That, that's not how it works. And that's the general traditional model of education that we're familiar with. Flips learning flips that model. The understanding and remembering is done prior to class, which means that when students come to class, they've got that base level knowledge, which means that you can then take them deeper, you can take them further. But if they have that moment where I've forgotten how to do this, that's okay because you're there. You are the one that can give them the support. For myself, I went to mum and she's like, oh, I don't know, I have no idea. Dad, dad was even worse, he didn't finish high school. He went and got a trade. So I had no help at home which meant that with no teacher there, I was stuck. I couldn't do my homework. I therefore got in trouble for not doing my homework, but I couldn't do my homework because I didn't have the support that I needed. This alleviates that problem. Now, I want to take this in a slightly different uh, direction. I want to use an analogy to help you understand this. I'm sure we've all got one of these. doesn't matter what brand it is, but I'm sure we've all got a smartphone of some description. There are a few things that you need for a smartphone. You need the hardware, obviously. For schools, this is the buildings, the books, the tables, the chairs, the teachers, the support staff. But to make the phone interesting, you need some apps. Now, I'm sure we've all got our favorite app. From an education point of view, your apps are your pedagogical strategies. Project-based learning, makerspace, coding, um, peer instruction, whatever it is that you happen to use in your particular context. I'll digress slightly, the most important app that we should have as teachers is relationships, but that's a different conversation. Where flipped learning fits in is in between hardware and apps. Flipped learning is the operating system. Utilising flipped learning as a paradigm of education allows you to meld your pedagogical strategies with your hardware, which means that in flipped learning you can do project-based learning, you can utilise makerspace it's not one or the other. It allows you to engage more in those other pedagogical strategies that you want to use. So Dave tells me that you're using Google or you've just sort of started to use Google Suite there. So this is what a workflow for flipped learning might look like in Google. You would start by creating or curating your learning objects. Generally, this will be videos. You'll then distribute the content to your students via Google Class. They will engage with that content, they'll collect it and they'll answer the questions, do the reading, whatever it is that they might need to do. They then revise and edit and turn it into you via Google Class. You can then comment, assess and return it and you can go, you know, you can go around back and forth at that point if you need to. And then at some point the work will be considered complete and added to an e-portfolio and you might use Google Sites for that. It's a general, that's a broad brushstroke look at what flipped learning might look like under Google Class. But what's it actually look like in the classroom? And that screen is not what I wanted to see. Let me see if I have the video on my desktop. There's a clip that, hmm, that's disappointing. There's a clip of a, yes, I do have it, excellent. Restore. Sorry about this, everyone. Here we go. This is a secondary physics teacher in the United States by the name of John Thomas Palmer. The video, this clip on the left, is his regular classroom before he started flipping. 
and I'm sure you can see the level of engagement that's going on and how active the students are. The clip on the right hand side is about 12 months later and it's the same topic. I'm sure you can see the difference. The students are, you can see there are some working in little groups, there are some working on the experiment itself. He's engaging directly with small groups of four or five of them at different times. He's doing different things. Now that little clip there in the middle, that's the start of that particular lesson. This bit here is what was happening at the end of the regular lesson. It's a massive difference and for his students, he was finding that there was benefits across the board, better test results, better relationships, able to do more experiments. The students were actually able to do the experiments themselves. In his regular classroom, there wasn't time. He just demonstrated at the front of the room. They'd watch and they'd take some notes and that was it. But down here, they can see it. They can engage with it themselves and they can ask questions directly of him in a small group uh, context. Uh, all right, now that's great. We've, we've seen what that looks like in the classroom, but how do we actually think about it so that we can plan and we can program? Obviously, um, that's quite a big part of our, our job as teachers is actually the paperwork, the administration. This is a rough sort of guideline as to what that process might look like. Uh, and again, I'll make this slide deck available afterwards so you can take your time looking over this. As a general rule of thumb, a couple of days out from the class, you'll have planned the in-class activity, which will be active, and it will take students into some deep learning. You'll also plan the accountability instrument. So whether that's going to be some kind of exit ticket, a quiz at the end, or some kind of way of demonstrating that they've understood and that they've been able to apply the knowledge or the skill, that will depend on your context and your subject. The day of the class or maybe the day before, you'll take a look at student results or student responses to the learning object, the video, the questions in the video, and you'll find, are there any misconceptions? If yes, add them to your Q&A list and alter the activity if necessary. If there's not, go straight to class. At the start, you might ask the class in general, who has questions from the video last night? Note down the misconceptions and then address them. Spend about 10 minutes actually addressing those misconceptions up front before students then go, try and apply their new knowledge into whatever the activity is. This means that if they've gone in with a misconception that will affect how they uh, apply themselves in that activity, that you've been able to address that and remediate any potential issues there. Class activity, about half an hour, and then allow time for a debrief and discussion at the end. I'm a massive believer that that debrief at the end of a lesson is as important as the explicit teaching component. Now, video content has a huge range of length of topics, but there are a few things that you do need to consider. There's a fairly wide body of research around the level of engagement of a video, sorry, with a video as opposed to the video length. This graph that you can see here uh, was done about the middle of last year, and they looked at um, 50,000 videos from YouTube. How long were they compared to how much of the video was watched? You can see when the video is sort of two minutes or less, there's, there's not much difference. You get about the same level of engagement. Between two minutes and seven minutes, though, there is a really significant drop off. And then from seven to about 13, it's pretty flat again. That's another bit of a sweet spot. And then 13 and after, you see a bit more of a drop off. General rule of thumb, if you're going to make your videos, is that you have one concept per video only helps you keep it short, but that you have no longer than one and a half minutes per scholastic age group. So year 10, for example, would not be any longer than 15 minutes. General rule of thumb to part two, five minutes or less, happy days. You really want to try and keep it nice and short, and that's where having one concept per video really comes into play. You might end up doing four two-minute videos that's fine, you, you're going to get a better engagement for each of those videos because they're so short. So you, have, you need to have sort of think about how can I chunk my concept or my knowledge or my skill or whatever it is, how can I chunk it to make it a bit more easily digestible? There are a few other things. You actually do need to provide PD for students around this. You need to teach them how to engage with the learning object. Anyone can go home and watch Batman, that's easy. But engaging with a learning that's learning should be different. 
because they need to not just watch it, they need to take it in. They need to be taking notes. They, If you make the videos interactive, which I would definitely recommend, they need to be answering those questions. So you need to teach them how to do that, how to recognise an important point that they need to take a note for and therefore pause the video. You need to teach them that, yeah, it's okay to scrub back and re-watch a section of the video. It's not as intuitive from the student side uh, as you might think. And I'll, I'll own that I've made that mistake of assuming that students know how to engage and have found out they haven't. Develop your own workflow. The workflow diagrams I've shown you, they're guidelines. They're, you know, this is how it can look, but have a think about what works for you in your context. You might want to model, your, model it off what I've shown you, but what works for you? Start simple. I absolutely recommend start simple. Pick one lesson one concept, one skill, one thing that you can work with that's a small little chunk that will allow you to wrap your head around the workflow, around getting the students used to it. For me, I started with spelling. We were, the students were used to the spelling test and they were used to the spelling program. I recorded a video with the spelling list for each week. The students knew where to access that video. They could then sit and they could listen to me saying the words and saying the words in a sentence, and they could practice their spelling whenever they wanted because it was on Google Drive. They could access it at home if they wanted to, or they could access it at school. It didn't require them to have necessarily copied the words correctly the first time. It also meant that on the Friday when we were doing our spelling test that if student A finished their test really early, they could then just move on to the next activity. They weren't having to wait for me to finish giving the words to the whole class. They could move straight on, which meant that it was really simple for them. They knew what the processes in the classroom, and that comes back to that PD point. Mathematics is another great one. Do one video. This is how you add, depending on your age level. PE, easy, easy. Whatever fundamental movement skill or sport you're trying to teach, video that game or that activity or that sport being done. That'll be a much more effective tool than trying to stand at the front, stand like this, move your body, shoulder should be here, and all those kinds of things that you often do trying to teach fundamental movement skills. And don't reteach. This is a really common mistake um, that John Bergman has seen in his travels around uh, looking at different schools doing flipped learning is that a student comes in, oh, sorry, I didn't watch the video last night, and the teacher reteaches it. That tells the rest of the students that flip learning doesn't actually matter. It doesn't matter if they don't watch the video. If they come in and they say they haven't watched the video, send them to the back of the room and tell them to put their headphones on. A really good way of doing that is make sure that that first, very first lesson, those first couple of lessons, have something really exciting planned as a practical activity for the students to engage with if they have completed that video. Because they'll work out pretty quickly that they'd rather be doing the fun, exciting experiment or activity or game than watching a video. In terms of offline flipping, it's um, been told to me that the internet there is not particularly great. Um, ClickView uh, does have what we call a local cache system. This allows you to, uh, we send you a hard drive that has all of the video content. Um, you then put that onto a school server, which means that you can access it anywhere in the school and it's not drawing on your internet it will pull from your server instead. USBs and DVDs are really cheap now as well. I use this. Uh, this year I had some students who couldn't get internet in where they lived. They're, we've got a couple of dead spots as far as internet goes. And I'd just give them a, a USB uh, or a DVD with the videos that they needed. And that was a really simple, effective way because they still had a computer at home or a DVD player or a TV with a USB slot on the side. They just didn't have the internet. Really easy way of getting around it. If you just don't want to engage with an electronic LMS, and it goes paper. And paper does work. There's nothing wrong with giving them a booklet with the unit mapped out and QR codes to where the videos are stored on the on the server. Now, in terms of actually utilising it, Google Suite is definitely much more than just a repository of videos. It's a much more powerful tool than that. This particular video here is, let me just turn that sound off. This is from a, uh, a Twitter chat that I was engaged in about the middle of last year. It developed quite extensively and there was probably about a dozen of us involved and we needed a better place than Twitter to really engage in the conversation. So we ended up in a Google Doc. And you can see here at the moment there are three or four different people typing at the same time. 
everyone who's logged into that Google Doc, their typing is a different, a slightly different colour. So you can monitor you know, who's actually typing what. You can see who's typing what. In terms of classroom application, collaborative writing is the really obvious example. But for science, you could have them working on lab reports together. Or you could have them for economics, you could have them writing uh, some kind of research paper together. There's also the function within Google Docs to comment. So if you want to have some peer instruction going on, you can have students um, reading through each other's work and leaving comments on particular sections. They might read a paragraph and put a comment, hey, this is great, but it needs X, Y, Z to really improve it. There are a lot of different options there for utilising the functionality within Google Suite other than just having a bunch of files on the cloud. Um, I don't know sort of what training you've been involved in, but there's a page on my website called FTPL videos, which is quite simply short videos, 10 minutes or less, with one particular skill in each. There's a series there on Google, um, a whole range of the functions within Google, Google Docs, Google Slides. Um, I'd encourage you to have a look at that if that's going to be of use for you personally. Now, in terms of what comes next, and I know that we've sort of pushed through this really, really quickly. Again, start with a single lesson. Don't try and dive in and do a whole unit at once unless you've got, you know, maybe three weeks to really think it out, think it through and really map it out. Start with one lesson. What's the learning goal for that lesson? What needs to be in the video for that lesson? How will I know when the students have got it, whatever the it is? And then what's going to be in the class activities in terms of what am I going to have the students doing in the classroom that is going to be third level and up of Bloom's Axonomy, applying, creating, synthesizing, etc. And the other thing is don't forget to collaborate. This is where Google, again, is hugely beneficial. My context this year, we had 10 classes in our stage group, year one, year two stage. And so we d divided the curriculum up. I programmed for PE, one of my colleagues programmed for science, someone programmed for handwriting, etc. All of those documents got put into a central Google Drive folder, which meant that anyone could access the resources at any point whenever they needed them. It was the assessment tasks, it was the scopes and sequence, it was the marking rubrics, there were lesson ideas, there were word lists, there were spelling lists. We put everything on there because it meant that Yes, I had to program the whole PE program myself, but that was it. I didn't have to worry about the rest of it because we shared that workload and we used Google Drive to make that available to each other. Um, I have sent through a lesson planning template. Um, I'm hoping that you sort of got that there. If you don't, I can put it up on the screen uh, later on. But it just gives you a bit of an idea of, of how to get started in terms of planning. It gives you something to work with at the start while you're still getting comfortable with flipped learning. Um, and that's that's the end of it. There's some list uh, bibliography where I've got the various images and, and videos from. There's a, still a lot of things within flipped learning that we haven't sort of touched on. Uh, and if you do want to find out more, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at the starting with flipped learning page on my website. I want to show you one more quick thing uh, within ClickView. Now, in terms of leveraging Google Suite, Google Classroom effectively, uh, ClickView has within it a function that, uh, a search engine called Albert, that for us here is mapped to the Australian curriculum. We do have, obviously for our UK schools, we do have it mapped to the British curriculum. It allows you to search by subject, uh, year group, and you can choose a, a strand. I don't know how the British curriculum is structured, I'm afraid. It will then give me all of the content that matches the criteria I put in. When I found a video that I want, I simply click on it. Right here, I can make this video interactive. It's a really quick process. I won't go into it. I don't think we have time and there are tutorials available for it, but I can make it interactive. A lot of our content will have teacher resources already available, but I want to share this to my students. So I simply click on share. I click on embed and I click on Google Classroom. What this now does is it takes me to the Google Class login page and when the internet on my side catches up. All I need to do now is choose which class do I want to send that piece of content to and do I want it to be an assignment, a question or an announcement. 
So we're trying, really trying to make things nice and easy for teachers because we understand that teachers don't have time. So we're trying to save you as much time as we can. We can have a look later on. I can show you where the links are for the tutorial videos if you do want to learn more about that side of things. Um, but in terms of flipped learning, there is a FlipCon in Spain in, I want to say June. Um, if you just Google FlipCon Spain, you'll be able to find the dates. I believe there is one in England later this year as well. Um, again, flipped learning, there's a whole range of resources on my website that will help you get started. But for now, I'm happy to take questions depending on the time frame that we have uh, left available. So uh, Dave or Kelsey, how are we going on your side? Uh, thanks, Brendan. We're just going to ask some questions now. So you've got any questions that you like reiterating or point to reiterating? I have a question. What would be the youngest age group that you would say would be appropriate to apply flip learning to? Yeah, great question. That one comes up a lot. Um, flip learning is predominantly secondary. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of tertiary. I'm primary trained and I've used it in, I had, last year I had year five and six, worked fantastically. This year I had year one and two. It still works, but you do it a little bit differently. Instead of sending the, the video content home, what I was doing this year with my six and seven year olds was as part of our literacy rotations, um, one of the rotations would be the, we had uh, four desktop computers, would be to go to the computer, listen to or watch the video um, and do the activity attached to that video. So you can do it down to as young as kindergarten. It just works a little bit differently in terms of the videos are used in the class, which is what we call an in-flip as opposed to a normal flip. Okay, thank you. Any uh, questions? If, if rather than um, a video or an interactive resource, you actually um, get the initial um, material that you gave to the children was, for example, a piece of writing. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's still classed as flipped learning? Yeah, so English teachers have been flipping for decades without even realising it. I'm yet to meet an English teacher who, when they do a book study, reads the book entirely in class. There's not time. So English teachers have been flipping for decades. In terms of writing, you can absolutely send that home and it depends on what you want to achieve with that. I would still look to make sure that your the task you set the students is on those sort of bottom two levels of Bloom's taxonomy so that if they do get stuck with the higher end stuff, it's when they're in the classroom with you. So you can definitely send other learning objects home um, you know, learning objects is not just a video, it can be whatever it needs to be. But just sort of keep in mind uh, Bloom's taxonomy and the sort of the hierarchy there. Let's bring, where is it? There. Were there any other questions? Uh, yeah, when, sorry. Um, yeah. When, in order to put any of this in place, we need something like a remote service. Sorry, you, you dropped it out in there. <laughs> That's all that. We, it, it looks brilliant. In order to put any of this in place, we need something like a remote server. We need to invest in a remote server. Sorry, you break up a little bit. Just a to clarify, to put the remote, you need some kind of... <laughs> It's a contentious point at the school. In order to facilitate any of this, we need to invest in a remote server. Uh, okay, that time you came through clearly. Um, not necessarily. It depends on how you want to go down the road. If you want to use um, purely video content, um, then it's something worth looking at. But you, as I said, you don't necessarily need to use video. Um, it is a great... Uh, teaching resource and the first place I go when I want to learn something is YouTube um, and that's this going to be the same for a lot of our students but you don't need to go that road a lot of it a lot of the planning and prep for myself personally I do that at home because I can then sit in the comfort of my own lounge and I can find my content um, and the students when they're doing their side of things it's generally with the older students at least it will also be at home because that's where we want them doing the understanding and the remembering. So the in-class side of things, it will depend entirely on what your subject area is. You want the students to be doing 
in your class. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, that's good. But we would, for example, to use Google Classroom, we would use a remote desktop connection. Yeah so, if, yeah, so if you're using Google Class, then you would need some kind of uh, school network um, or school networks if, if you have you know, multiple spread across different parts of the campus uh, and some kind of internet. I mean, Google Class in and of itself doesn't utilise that much bandwidth. It's then down to the content that you put on Google Class. So if you are putting a lot of video content, then it would be a case of, hey, students, please you know, don't access that video content until you get home. Uh, Brendan, can I just ask you, um, I saw that you had emailed me the uh, the lesson, was it the lesson plan or the lesson scheme that you'd sent? Uh, can you just flash it up on the screen for us, please? Because I will then send it to everyone. At least I'll then know what uh, I'm sending them. Is that large please. enough on your side or do you need me to shrink that in a little bit to show more of the page? No, no, don't shrink it down anymore. That, that's fine. fine. Um, so this, everyone, this is what I will send to you so that you can see the structure um, and, and when you're building in your, your lessons. So I'll actually go and do that immediately we finish the presentation um, while Sean is speaking about the maths. Are there any other questions that people would like to raise or are people relatively clear? There's a lot of links. I, I did send you the one that Brendan sent me um, and I actually went on and saw the one about the physics and some of you may have done the same. There's certainly a lot of material there. Um, okay, Brendan, that, thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, we're really grateful for you joining us uh, this morning. Um, enjoy your weekend and uh, we'll be in touch. Fantastic. Don't hesitate to reach out if you need more information. All right. Thank you so much indeed. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what we're going to uh, do now, I'm going to go and send you the, the, um, the lesson. Uh, like he said, in some cases, some of